Hello everybody, and welcome back to Space Engine. Always fun. Oh, I'm in spaceship mode. Oops. Uh, click. There we go. That's right, I was doing B-roll for my last video. Um, that nobody watched, because why would they? Anyways, um, today we're going to go to a few places. I was re uh, requested to find a galaxy at the edge of the universe. So we're going to do just that, because, well, why not? Uh... Yeah, let's just do this. <laughs> Great. Now there is a finite space to Space Engine. It does stop rendering galaxies after after a time, so we can in fact find an edge of the universe. But in real in reality, there isn't really an edge of the universe. If you go in one direction long enough, you'll just curve around back to where you started. If it's a closed universe, if it's an open universe, you'll just go forever. But um, yeah. I'm trying to think if there's evidence one way or the other. Something is a closed, something is an open. I remember reading a paper recently about the universe being possibly an open universe. I'm not sure. I'll have to check that. Or is it a closed universe? I think a closed universe makes more sense to me from a spatial point of view. But then again, the universe is not uh, duty-bound to make sense to anybody. It is what it is. All right. Welcome to the edge of the universe. This is a bright galaxy. And eh, it's more of an elliptical. Let's find a, uh, a prettier one. That's also kind of at the edge here. Something more blue. Uh, although, well, actually, wait a minute. You there. It's a regular galaxy. Can we go faster, please? Uh, a lot of blue stars. Uh, eh, there's probably not be a lot there worth finding. Ooh, how about you? An irregular, an elliptical. Uh, I guess all we're gonna find is regular ellipticals, so. Let's go to the elliptical then, sure. All right. And we are here at the end of the universe. Let's see what we can find here. Yellow dwarf with nine planets. That's suspiciously familiar. And a red luminous super giant. Ooh, it's a binary even. White super giant. Luminous binaries yellow giants. Anyways, um, another topic I was asked to talk about was the book The Teeming Universe, or Teeming Galaxy. Yes, the uh, the Teeming Universe. I was correct the first time. Anyways, uh, it's a speculative evolution book, or biology book, about... Well, it's, it's basically, it, it's formatted like a field guide to alien life on other planets, and it talks about how they evolved based on their conditions and whatnot. It's basically exactly the kind of topic I love, and I actually do want this book. I have not read it, though. Um, but it's just speculative evolution uh, using alien environments for, as a starting point. Uh, it actually kind of reminds me of Wayne Barlow's Expedition, only with no narrative. Because... Well, actually, it might have a narrative. I don't know. I don't think it has a narrative. I think it's mostly just a field guide type situation. Whereas Wayne Barlow's Expedition was a narrative. And that was actually turned into a documentary, quote-unquote, a docudrama, a docu-fiction, I think they're called, uh, called Alien Planet on Discovery Channel. That came out in 2008, I believe. And that was actually, like, I watched it, and it was on, and uh, I loved it when I was a kid. It was the coolest thing ever. And it was actually one of the beginnings of me wanting to get into astrobiology as a career choice. And I still do, but unfortunately, uh, life got in the way, and I'm no further ahead on that. But don't worry. We're gonna get there eventually. God, it sucks not being able to, like, go to university. Oh, well, anyways. Point is, really cool. Uh, it's a, the, like, the... I never actually read Expedition, 
but the docufiction is basically about a probe going to a planet called Darwin 4, like what, six light years away, and it just talks about the life there. And the teeming universe is basically the same kind of thing, where it's a field guide talking about different planets and different star systems with different life that evolves in them. And it's all speculative evolution. It sheds diagrams of these creatures and how they evolved, how they how they operate, how their biology works. It's just stuff that I love because that's the topic that's just so much fun. I love stuff like that. I genuinely hope that I've been uh, recording this whole time. But anyways, and it's similar to kind of a project I'm working on. I'm working on so many projects. But like, I mentioned it before, um, I believe I mentioned it before. I call it the Martian Report. It's about like the War of the Worlds, and I'm basically doing a uh, a science write-up report, like compendium, that's in universe to War of the Worlds, where it talks about like the last hundred years of research and study on Martian technology and Martian biology post invasion, and I need to actually work on that at some point. Right now, actually the reason why I haven't been doing videos the last, like, week is because of my writing projects. Uh, I'm finishing up, well, I finished up a uh, short story collection. I can't see my, there it, there it is, oh wait, no. Yeah, there it is. I couldn't see my, uh, the cursor on the screen. Anyways, I finished up a short story collection that I'm currently just doing some formatting stuff for, and I'm going to start selling it. Um... Although, the short stories can be also be read for free in my portfolio, because I, I like the idea of sharing, like, you know, selling them in a collection, but I don't like paywalling stuff. I really don't. This is why I'm not good at making money, because I don't like forcing people to give me money. I, I like sharing things freely. But, either way, that'll be up for sale at some point. I'll definitely make an announcement for that. It'll be an ebook and hard copy. But that's like a self-published thing, so it's not really that big of a deal. Um, and then the actual novel I've been working on, which I'm actually going to pitch to publishers, uh, I'm like more than halfway done with that, like 70,000 words into it so far. And that one I'm actually going to pitch to publishers, because like you can't really pitch a... Uh, right, it's really hard to pitch a short story collection, especially if you're a, a new author. So I'm like, yeah, I'll just, I'll just kind of slip that through as an ebook and uh, go from there. But either way, speculative biology, I love it. It's a just such a fun thing to do. It's it's basically like fantasy football, but for nerds. Like really well, like not like biology nerds and astronomy nerds. Where instead of like picking how does fantasy football even work? It's like you pick uh players and then you make a fake team, and then based on how the players actually do in their seasons, your team your fantasy team gets points. I don't know how it works. Either way, it's kind of like that, but instead of um, people giving themselves brain damage while playing a stupid sport, it's you take concepts in biology and known concepts in astronomy, like planets and conditions, and you try to make ecosystems that make sense to that environment, and it's just so much fun. And I, I, and when I say fun, I genuinely mean it's fun. I mean, I find it fun. It can be really unfun if you're not into that, but it's, it's, it's very fun to me. Um, like, I love designing creatures that just live in weird environments. Like in my, in my book that I'm working on, I'm trying to find a good, interesting star system. In the book, it's like I've kind of touched more and more onto the biology of uh, the creature in it. And I keep, there is one thing I always fall back on, which is whenever I'm talking about, like, circulation and, like, oxygen transport, I like to give creatures something different than hemoglobin, which is what we use, iron-based. Not for any reason beyond the fact that I just like, I just think it's interesting. Um, <laughs> actually, in this case, it does kind of make sense, but it also doesn't make sense. But the creature uses hemocyanin instead of hemoglobin, which is copper-based proteins in a hemolymph instead of blood. And it kind of makes sense it, based on the environment of the creature. Oop, I saw life. Uh, not to give too many spoilers, not that anyone really cares, but it's like, it's kind of like a large arthropod 
type creature, but it's not an arthropod. It just kind of has that look to it. But its planet is a low pressure, uh, high oxygen argon atmosphere. So it's like, pressure wise, it's a bit lower than what astronauts use in spacesuits on the space station kind of thing. So it's like, it's less than half of Earth standard pressure. And it's like, what was it, like 80% oxygen and then 20 or like 14 or 15% argon with some trace amounts. So it's like, I was, when I was working on it, I was like, it would make more sense for this creature to have hemoglobin just because it's in a low pressure environment, so it needs better oxygen transport. But it's also in an oxygen enriched environment, so hemocyanin could possibly work. So for just biological intrigue, I decided to go with hemocyanin because it was interesting. And I like saying the word hemocyanin. I like writing about it and I like talking about it. Um, actually, a fair bit of its biology makes some sense. Like, or it's the reason some parts of it are very, like, convergent evolution, whereas others are. I didn't even look at the planet, did I? Where others are more, like, out there and kind of weird. So, it's kind of a good mix. Because when I was designing it, I was like, I don't want an alien creature that, that that's just, like, a gray or a humanoid with a weird forehead. And I didn't want it to have a verbal language because the concept, or even even just like any kind of auditory language, like, it, well, actually, it still might have one. I just haven't included it in the story yet, or if I even will, I don't know. But it's like the concept of like, oh, you can somehow figure out an alien's verbal language because it has similar syntax and structure to an Earth language. It's like, no, no. I don't, I don't like that. It just seems too easy. I like in Star Trek when they find a creature whose language is so just different that the, the, the universe translator has no idea. So I've kind of done that, but um, yeah, I, I love it. I love comparative evolution. I love speculative evolution. Working on the Martian Report, actually, technically I started working on that probably five or six years ago. Before I even wanted to make it into a, into, a, into a book, I was already thinking about, it's like looking at details in the novel War of the Worlds, how would the Martians work? What makes them operate? How do they live? What, like, you know, how does their technology work based on what we know? And I've been kind of doing notes and working on it, and I've gotten some pretty intense details into how I suspect uh, all of these things work, and it's gonna be quite interesting to read, write about. The technology side is actually quite interesting because it has some stuff in it that was mentioned with no explanation. Like, there's a green gas that operates in the fighting machines of which there was no explanation of what it is or how it works. And there's also this brown fluid that's in Martian machinery of which there was no explanation of what it, what it is or how it works. It's just there. So I'm going to have to be creative with that. And I have some ideas. And the Martian biology is actually interesting too, because this is a case where I, I have to make their blood based on hemoglobin, because they basically feed by blood transfusion. I mean, theoretically they could like screen out uh, all the blood factors and just infuse plasma from their victims, but according to the book, it looked like they were doing whole blood transfusions, not just uh, like plasma infusions. So. Yeah, I'm going to assume they have uh, hemoglobin-type blood, but they also might not have uh, immune systems or blood or the same. Either they don't have functional immune systems, which is makes sense according to the book, or they don't have blood, uh, um, what do you call it, blood factors, like uh, blood-type factors. Which would also make sense because they reproduce via budding, so their, gen their genetic diversity would actually be very low. So, I'm trying to figure out exactly how that's going to work with their circulation and all that. Basically, all they need to do is extract nutrients um, from the blood itself. So, I could potentially get away with just doing uh, plasma infusions and having it where it's like in the device they use, there's a membrane. So it looks like, you know, they're getting whole blood infusions, but they're actually just getting plasma. 
I'm not entirely sure. I might I, when, I, when I reach that section about how they how they operate with their circulation, I might do a like an like it's basically going to be a um, a collection of research done from 1890 to 1990. So I can possibly do differing levels of knowledge and we figure out exactly how it works. So those are those small dumb details that I I love talking about is like the, the details, the small little bits. How do these things operate? There's also going to be vestigial organs within the Martians and vestigial structures because there's evidence in the book that the Martians potentially started out as a humanoid creature similar to humans and they evolved to become basically just giant brains uh, in tentacle monsters because their internal anatomy is mostly brain and lung and circulation of course it's like heart brain lung so there isn't very much room for anything else Ooh, a black hole so and there's also in the book they, they talked about a second martian species that was within the cylinder it was dead mind you but they did talk about how they found these like humanoid spindly silicone like silicone based bone creatures that were desiccated and they were probably used as like blood reserves for the martians on the trip to earth so i can also talk about them and uh do some speculation about the martian environment based on that <laughs> there's actually some people who talk about how or who they think that the secondary martians in the in the novel war of the worlds were actually the selenites from the moon from h.g wells other book first men in the moon which were these bug creatures that lived on the moon so there's some suspicion that the Martians, uh, oh nice, it's basically kidnaps, like they basically kidnap um, humanoid creatures from other planets and use them as like livestock. So the uh, the other Martians on Mars could actually be selenites stolen from the moon. I'm not sure how I feel about that, to be honest. I, I kind of like the various novels to be separate entities. So I'm probably going to put the uh, the secondary Martians as actual native Martian subspecies um, just for ease and uh, biological intrigue on the planet. Although I, you know, I probably will toss in the speculation that they might be non-native to the planet just because. But, um, oh, this has uh, marine life. But we'll see. So yeah. I, I love speculative biology. I really do want to get uh, the teeming universe. I've looked into it a lot, and I'm going to get it eventually. I want to read it because it looks great. And I love the topic. And if you like hearing me talk about speculative biology, well, then you should probably get the book too because my disjointed ramblings don't do the topic justice, and it's better to actually look through it in a more concise, non-rambly manner without stuttering and uh, everything else, the random... <laughs> topic jumps and the jolts. I just get really excited about it. It's it's a really cool thing. Like, um, or like how I always talk about how much I love K-type stars, because I think they're great. But K-type stars produce more uh, UV radiation, so it's like a, a life, a planet around a K-type star. You know, it might have more ozone. It could, or it could have more ozone and more thicker atmosphere, in which case the life doesn't care. Or it could, you know, be a planet similar to Earth, which less ozone, less atmosphere, and the life just evolved to be more radiation resistant, which is also a possibility. And I like thinking about that. It's like, and on a planet that actually has higher radiation, like UV flux, you might actually get faster evolution. Not so much because radiation is a mutagen, although that, that is a factor, but more so because early on, life that it develops would have to adapt to the UV radiation very quickly. And then every time it does a new evolutionary step, it would have to adapt. So like when a, a single cell organism adapting to you, a high radiation environment is one thing, but a multicellular organism or a colony organism adapting to that is another. So once you start getting multicellular, like multicellular colonies in life, they have to start figuring out how to adapt to this higher radiation flux when you have more parts that can go wrong. So there's potential that um, planets with low radiation environments, like a, you know, a, say a, a super Earth around a 
G type star with a thick atmosphere. So there's very little actual radiation penetration to the surface of the planet. So the only radiation they're exposed to is like on the surface itself. So probably like your, your usual uraniums and thoriums and your, your radon gas from the, uh, the decay rates. So you have this life, and if it lives in the water, even more so, you probably have life that radiation isn't a huge thing for it, at least not um, penetrating ionizing radiation. Creatures that live in ice shell moons, like Europa, for example, probably wouldn't have much radiation resistance because there just wouldn't be any. Like, Europa orbits in a particularly horrible location, which is in uh, in and out of Jupiter's fel face melty radiation belts, but because it has a massively thick ice shell of water ice, which is a great radiation shield, you also have liquid water oceans to swim in, which is also a very good radiation shield. It's kind of like how um, divers, like scuba divers, can actually swim in like those big, like in, in nuclear in nuclear power plants, those big water tanks that they put the like reactors in or they put the storage rods in. You can actually swim in those tanks. It's not advisable, and divers who do, they still wear like you know protective clothing. But your radiation exposure for swimming in that, despite the fact you have a incredibly like radioactive uh, material below you, isn't all that much because the water is a great moderator and a great radiation shield. So life that exists in an ice shell moon would probably be very susceptible to radiation damage because they never had to evolve to really deal with it. And I find that just fascinating to think about. So. Yeah, uh, we are at 22 minutes. I should probably wrap it up here. I hope you enjoyed my ramblings about speculative biology. I will be sure to do more later. If you have a place for me to go, let me know. If you want topics for me to talk about, let me know. I didn't really go to Burmese star systems. I was too distracted this, this, this episode, and I apologize. But I hope I was at least interesting. So <laughs> thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Um, like, comment. If you want to subscribe, you can. Although I suspect you probably already are subscribed, because most people who watch this are. <laughs> if you want to help out the channel, you can below, and I will talk to you guys later. And space?